uh, to start with a discussion um, from a more clinical point of view. We all know uh, that the risk of metastasizing is dependent uh, on certain features of the primary tumor. This means the site, the T category, the depth of infiltration, you mentioned this, and maybe the t tumor volume, and maybe other factors like histopathological grade or vascular invasion. And this means that uh, nearly all patients with a suspicion of a malignant tumor need some kind of imaging. I would say, except early vocal cord carcinomas, where the risk of metastasizing is so low said that we do not need it. And uh, you, you have showed, showed us um, very nicely uh, in, your, in, the, in this, your lists of the sensitivity and specificity figures um, that these figures are, are very high in these studies uh, for, for all the imaging methods, for the CT, for the MRI, for, for ultrasound, together with fine needle aspiration biopsies. Um, but as, as our clinical practices regard it, uh, we must see, unfortunately, uh, that uh, we are not as good as the studies. So my first question would be to all of the panelists, uh, when you evaluate a patient, let me say, with a T2 base of tongue cancer and then clinically N0 neck, which kind of imaging methods would you use? Please start around, yes, please. Yeah. For a T2 uh, base of tongue cancer, we would do a uh, MRI scan, and the MRI has, has, a, has a fairly good sensitivity uh, to, uh, to be able to, uh, to judge the, uh, the involvement of the neck, yes or no. Uh, so an MRI scan. An MRI scan with and a con contrast, some kind of. I think they, they will typically use gadolinium. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. If there is doubt, or the contralateral side needs to be uh, uh, brought uh, brought in uh, in uh, image better because uh, because that might might dictate the uh, the treatment radiation to the contralateral neck. Yes or no. You could uh, you could also uh, do an, uh, an ultrasound with with a cytology of a, of a suspicious node or a, or a uh, marginally uh, enlarged node. So, but typically MRI. An MRI. Mm -hmm. Pat. Uh, in in the UK, with a socialized medicine, as a clinician, I would look for an MR with with contrast. But we can get a CT scan done within three or four days, uh, and then at our multidisciplinary clinic. The radiologist, having reviewed the CT scan, would then recommend the MRI scan, which he can get done within one day. So there's a control on availability of scanning uh, within our system, and uh, this, in a way, allows our radiologists to control and also allows them to learn and, and teach within that system. So I would, in preference, look for an MR with contrast, mm -hmm. but I get a CT first. Mm -hmm. And I would like to prefer MRI as well. However, I have to tell you honestly that uh, by us, uh, the availability of MRI is not so easy as CT. And in some cases, uh, not to put the patient on the waiting list, we uh, have to choose the CT, despite the fact that we know MRI would have been better. But in addition, in, in some cases, I think uh, uh, it may be combined after MRI or CT investigation, also in some special cases, uh, the ultrasound investigation combined with fine needle respiration, especially in the uh, nod, uh, the predicted uh, metastasis, the nodule is less than 10 millimeter or less than uh, 8 millimeter. In that case, uh, I think even the MRI, even uh, the, the CT scan cannot uh, uh, point it out exactly whether it's a metastatic lymph node or uh, just uh, a reactive lymph node. But I think probably you may block me if is it not true? If uh, we have a, a lymph node less than 8 millimeter, then uh, it can be uh, followed by uh, ultrasound guided uh, fine needle aspiration. And if had the positive uh, aspirate, then the problem is cleared. Mm 
Yeah, that's clear. Now, I see there is a consensus that in this case an MRI scan would be the best. Yeah. Uh, but the clinical practice is that some patients come with a CT scan. And now, my question is to Professor Vogel. He is the diagnostic radiologist. Our patient has a, uh, a, the CT scan in his hand. And mm -hmm. what would be for these CT scans your technical requirements? Mm -hmm. And when would you order additionally an MRI? Okay, thanks for, I think, a good, uh, let's say, a good concordance here in our auditorium. I, th I think from our daily work, it's important to look at the patient, and I think that's a sign also of our very good cooperation. You know, I think it's a good way to have an MRI, but there are some patients in the MRI that will always have poor studies of those patients in a very bad condition, having swallowing problems. I think uh, we have now decided that this makes no sense to put them half an hour in an MRI scanner, yeah. which is still necessary. Um, so I think those patients might be, if they come in with a good CT scanner, 3D reconstruction in a coronal orientation, having also a good view on the vessel, that might be okay. So we say if a patient is a, in a good condition, he's a good MRI candidate with gadolinium and maybe in autumn here also with CNRM, but if his condition is more weak, if he doesn't like narrow areas like a tunnel in an MRI scanner, it's better to have a good high resolution CT. So if a patient comes in with a CT, we will have a look and um, uh, if there are open questions, it might make sense to have an additional uh, MRI, especially if we have a patient who goes in a complex chemotherapy <coughs> study. Uh, when we have to look at recurrent disease, it's always a good way to have the same imaging study before and also for the evaluation of the tumor response. Yes, that's clear. Yes, yeah, thanks for this. Now, um, with coming, coming back uh, to the ultrasound yeah, and together with the fine needle aspirations, and we all know that this, uh, this uh, ultrasound examination has an experienced hand a, a very high sensitivity and it has a high specificity also uh, since the pathologists uh, are able to diagnose uh, tumor cells in the fine needle aspirates uh, very precisely. That's not a difficult differential diagnosis or so. And uh, now we know that, especially in Amsterdam, there is a lot of experience with this technique. And uh, Dr. Lehmanns, could you say us a little bit more about sensitivity, specificity, and indications? Yeah, thank you. Yes, especially uh, in cases where we uh, need to decide whether to do an elective neck dissection, yes or no, I think an ultrasound uh, is an ideal examination if, if, if the, there's no other reason to do a, a MRI or, or CT scan. So typically the, the early staged uh, anterior oral cavity uh, tumors would qualify for such, an, uh, for such a procedure. And uh, it is well known that, that these patients have a a priori chance of let's say 30-35% uh, occult uh, nodal disease. So without any, any studies or only using your fingers, you would probably do an elective neck dissection and that's, that, that's a good situation. By using ultrasound uh, together with, uh, with fine needle aspiration, uh, which has a, a sensitivity of about 75% in experienced hands, that is, and you're quite right that the specificity is nearing 100%, uh, you are able to, to reduce this a priori chance to, let's say, uh, a range below the uh, typical 20% uh, that everybody uses uh, to do an elective neck, yes or no. So if we have a uh, negative ultrasound for a T1, T2 uh, tongue cancer, we would typically refrain from doing a, a elective neck dissection, but uh, what we will do is follow up this patient every six weeks for the first year with the same method with ultrasound and cytology. So if uh, a tumor still, uh, or a uh, neck node still, uh, still occurs, we will able to capture it in an early phase yeah. and then we are able to, uh, to, uh, to salvage the neck. We, uh, we prove that and we, uh, we publish that. Good. Yeah, thanks. We will come to this, uh, to this point of the indication for the elective neck dissections in a few minutes. And I would first ask Dr. Lichtenberger. He has brought us a case. Yeah, yeah. And we would like to have Dr. Lichtenberger's slides, please, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with a hey. special case of fine yeah. needle aspiration. Would, uh, would, would you mind to allow me uh, some comments yes, to the statistic? Uh, because the statistics are different. Mm -hmm. I have another statistic. I looked at uh, the international literature, and I yeah. quite amazing for me. 
that uh, compared the per patient and uh, CT, MRI, and ultrasound, the best result could be achieved with ultrasound combined with fine needle aspiration. And better result than uh, in this statistic, there was to, uh, to uh, see that uh, the palpation was over 60% uh, sensitivity. And uh, by the MRI and CT, 38 approximately. And with the uh, uh, ultrasound combined with fine needle aspiration, over 90, 93. That's, according to this statistic, the best sensitivity can be achieved by ultrasound combined with fine needle yeah. aspiration. Who would agree with Dr. Lichtenberger? From the panel? I think ult ultrasound is still very much user dependent, and yeah. I think uh, certainly in the UK, again in our socialist system, as clinicians we're not allowed to purchase imaging equipment because radiology have the, uh, the stranglehold on its purchase and its maintenance. So we rely on our radiologists to do the ultrasound needle biopsies. Mm -hmm. And again, it very much depends on who you get on which day. Uh, as to how accurate that is. So again, it might be your variation on your specificity and sensitivity. Uh, I agree, if you get a specimen, the pathologist should be able to say yes or no. Uh, but I think it's getting a representative aspirate. But uh, we do it on a lot, and, and we, we take it into consideration with the patient and the size of the tumor, and uh, etc. cetera. And with other clinical, yeah. clinical aspects, Dr. Fuhr. Um I would uh, like to bring in two points. Uh, first of all, Aspiration cytology, you have a lot of experience in, uh, in your side. Um, how, how precise is it? We know from our MRI studies on this microfoci, we had two patients with so small microfoci that, um, do you know how, how yeah. you would charge you with <coughs> diagnostic accuracy? Does it really exclude micro? No, of, of course not. And, and that's exactly the reason that you will never be able to, to get a sensitivity above, let's say, 75% because you miss the, the uh, micrometastasis, but even then by having such a specificity you can still lower the uh, chance of occult nodal disease to an acceptable level to refrain from neck dissection. That's the, that's the argument we are making, but I quite agree, you, in, in theory or in practice you can never, never get sensitivities above 75% because you miss the, uh, the uh, micrometastasis. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. Um, you, yeah. Your case? Yeah. Yes, please. Dr. Lichtenberger brought us a Thank you very much for the possibility. A, a difficult uh, case uh, with an interesting differential diagnosis. Um, thank you very much. You allowed me to present uh, this case. Uh, I, using this case, I would like to highlight uh, the problem that may uh, happen by performing blind uh, final mm -hmm. aspiration. Uh, and uh, I need a, a case history uh, to <clears throat> underline uh, this, uh, his, this uh, situation. Uh, the case of uh, a uh, 68-year-old male patient was admitted to the nearest hospital for excision of a small basileum on the skin of the face by performing routine examination at 2.5 millimeter mass, uh, 2.5 centimeter mass, a 2.5 million S was also detected in front of the lower third of the standard muscle uh, negative or a star status. Excuse me, this 2.5 centimeter, not millimeter. Uh, after uneventful excision of the small uh, basilum, the patient underwent aspiration cytology from the neck mass. Result, after hematoxin E was in staining, there were in serum fluid monoclear and histocytic cells and some washed red blood cells. Diagnosis, the cytological appearance represented fluid content of a cyst. Without having any epithelial cells, further diagnosis concerning the cyst wall is not possible. The question arises on this case that uh, uh, which part of the module have been punctured and uh, the other, the solitary cyst in this anatomical region. The patient underwent removal of the neck mass histology metastasis of papillary carcinoma. Patient was admitted to the uh, next institution and it was admitted to us. We performed an ultrasound investigation, including target lens, scintigraphy, which shows negative, uh, which shows cold part 
in the lower aspect of both thyroid glands, thyroid hormone levels normal, thyroglobulin level elevated. We perform the surgery, as you may see here, uh, modified radical neck dissection with preservation of the spinal axis or the internal jugular vein and uh, also the stenoid muscle and uh, also other uh, hypoglossus and so on. Is next. And uh, then uh, um, <clears throat> we uh, identified and preserved, preserved on the left side, you may see uh, the recurrent nerve, uh, checking with the neuromonitor, then the same on the other side, and performed a total thyroidectomy. And uh, uh, of course, in addition, the modified red connection clear uh, the medial compartment. Postoperative examination scintigraphy, nose radio tumor tissue, uh, ultrasound nose radio tumor tissue, postoperative therapy, iodine 131 isotope therapy, dosage 2.6 uh, mega, uh, giga becquerel. Follow up one year, the patient is free from complaints, symptoms, uh, thyroglobin globally level not detectable. Was investigate ultrasound is negative. In conclusion, I would like to say I think it's important by setting up the diagnosis that the cytological diagnosis has to be considered and compared to the clinical appearance and to the evaluation the neck by physical examination. Okay. It was correct, I think, in this case to perform aspiration cytology. However, there was not the likelihood that there is a real solitary cyst in the dentary area. Probably the cytology diagnosis may have been more accurate by par- performing ultrasound guided aspiration. That was the case. No. Thank Th- you. Thank you very much. That uh, mm-hmm. you could demonstrate us that, in, uh, especially in the uh, tumors of the thyroid, uh, the fine needle aspiration cytology is diagnostically very useful. But now let's come. Let's go back to the squamous cell carcinomas. Now, um, is today is there an indication for an elective surgical uh, for treatment of the neck surgical staging? for elective neck dissection, and uh, has anyone experience with sentinel lymph node biopsies in you diagnostic the, You mean the clinically an imaged end of yes, neck? Yes, please, yeah. in the end of neck, yeah. I, I think there are indications uh, for considering, as you said, select our sentinel node biopsy, which is useful to try and determine uh, kind of how active is the neck, and equally to evaluate the contralateral neck, because sometimes there's a reluctance to do bilateral neck dissections, and I think by uh, using a technetium injection or a dye-labeled um, marking of the primary tumor, but it, sadly it's, it's most, mostly used in oral cavity and oral pharynx, but uh, I understand that some magicians are able to tattoo to hypopharynx and uh, other sites, uh, and that is equally important, I think, uh, but I think it's got to be remembered that the sentinel node biopsy is diagnostic. It's not a therapeutic procedure. Uh, right. Therefore, the question really is, on your experience or on the size of the primary disease, you've still got to frequently make a decision as to whether or not you treat the neck. So you may ultimately do an elective neck dissection or an elective selective neck dissection in order to uh, harvest sufficient lymph nodes to determine whether or not there is uh, micro disease uh, which might not be picked up by any other way. So I think there are indications for there are, elective neck dissection. Despite uh, the sophisticated imaging in the neck, there are indications for elective neck treatment I think in a I selective th- neck dissection and for uh, staging methods like the sentinel node biopsy. I think one would have to say as a, as, a, as a surgeon, to me, the ultimate diagnosis of neck metastasis is histologic proof. That's true. Yeah. Dr. Fogel? Um, there would be a question maybe back to you. If you have a patient like I showed with a tonsillar carcinoma, stage T2, and we have, we do an MRI with contrast agent, and I uh, tell you that there is uh, a small uh, lymph node on the contralateral side, and maybe a second one on the right side, how you would uh, include that patient in the protocols? Would you do a chemo radiotherapy before, or surgery primary, or how you would decide? I think would you rely on my findings? Okay, that's a topic of its own. But. I would certainly rely on your findings from your talk. Um, I think the question is, would it change the management of your patient? And I think uh, generally the treatment of posterior tongue cancer 
uh, is chemo radiation, uh, which would include both of those necks. And I think it would be important to subsequently follow up your suspicion that these necks were positive. And if that uh, unilateral or bilateral lymph node uh, adenopathy remained, uh, I would say, active or more active as time went on, then, and your imaging showed that, then you would intervene. Okay. But I think it's a baseline before you commence your okay. treatment, which I think is important. Okay. Dr. Lehmann, what's your policy in your department? Do you do sentinel lymph node biopsies? No, we haven't gone yeah. to doing that yet. But, but we have tried to do the, the sentinel lymph node uh, concept and combine it with, uh, with ultrasound and cytology to be able to uh, find out if it could st enhance the uh, sensitivity, and it couldn't. But, but that might, in hindsight, not, not be too surprising since it's very difficult to exactly puncture the node that was uh, hot on, uh, on scintigraphy, of course. Uh, but we tried it and it didn't work out. So you either do um, an ultrasound with fine needle aspiration cytology and put the patient on a wait and see policy if the primary tumor allow this, or you do an elective neck dissection. That's right, and, and uh, still, of course, uh, an indication course. for elective neck yeah. dissection. When you have to enter the neck, anyhow you do it, if the patient yeah. will not come to you for follow-up or lives abroad, then you do it, of course. Now, this is important. Are there any comments or questions from the audience, especially <laughs> on this? I see nobody. Then an, another uh, important thing is with this imaging techniques. Um, what would you say, Dr. Vogel, is the standard for clinical studies? When we now plan a clinical study, let, let me say a hemoradiation study, what's the standard for, for imaging of the neck, for the, for the protocols? Um, I think if you're asking on uh, imaging studies, especially for uh, either radiotherapy or uh, chemoradiotherapy, um, I think here clearly due to a lot of changes I showed you, I think um, uh, MRI would be, would be uh, the first tool. It makes sense to have in some of the protocols uh, to have maybe a PET, an initial yep. PET study also included. Uh, I think then you are on a both safe side in order to pre-plan a patient. Uh, I think a PET study, it, it has not to be a PET CT study because PET, if you have a good working up with your CT, you can fusion afterwards. It's for us, it comes in the same way to go, but I think a PET, an initial PET and an MRI study. This would be the that would be the thing. highest yeah. level of the highest level study. Of evidence for this. Any other? Well, I, I would agree uh, an MRI is often the first. Uh, PET we would, we would only do if, if there is an indication for, in the sense that there's a high, uh, high chance for distant meds, for instance, and that is if there's massive neck nodes or low jugular neck nodes or bilateral neck nodes, then we would do a PET to exclude distant metastasis. But in other situations, uh, we would probably not do a, a PET at the initial staging. I think I have to add, of course, a CT study, for example, of the chest to exclude also a secondary lung carcinoma. Yeah. Uh, and that may be an advantage of performing, a, for clinical studies, a, a PET initially, because especially in these areas mm -hmm. of small uh, non-cell squamous cell lung carcinoma, the, the PET sensitivity is extremely good. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, imaging of the treated neck? We know that it's if the patient has already had a neck dissection, maybe a neck dissection and radiotherapy, uh, that now the postoperative follow-up <coughs> is much more difficult than in the untreated neck. Yeah. What would you recommend? What to do and uh, in, in which, which intervals would you do an imaging studies? Would you do imaging studies at all or would you rely on your, your clinical impression or examination? First the clinicians. Thank you. I think uh, uh, for us the first choice is ultrasound. And uh, uh, even uh, is uh, very important in such cases, we, uh, if one follows the watch and see policy. And uh, because it's a cost effective and fast non-invasive procedure and can be repeated several times. 
and mm -hmm. the, the possibility to check the patient in such situation in every month after uh, the operation of the primary tumor uh, without a combination of an elective neck yeah. dissection, dissection. However, I think that the, the problem is uh, more, much more complicated if the patient underwent uh, after the primary tumor uh, irradiation therapy of the neck because there is always some edema. And the, to watch the neck by using ultrasound is quite uh, difficult and this depends on the experience of the persons who are doing this uh, procedure, this investigation. But what would you do in what, Nottingham? To me, I think you've, you've got two scenarios, haven't you? You've got the patient who has been treated with curative intent and remains potentially salvageable if they fail. And then you've got the other patients who were treated with, uh, how would I say, expectant cure, but probably palliative. I think both of those patients need to be separated, and usually that decision is made uh, on embarking your treatment. But I would, we would tend to use an MRI on the uh, treated neck uh, at six months uh, and rely a bit on... Once, on, at six once, months. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. at six months, on the assumption that if that was clear, having had a pre-treatment scan, there wasn't a great deal of change, uh, then we would continue to observe that patient clinically. But if there was change or suspicion of disease, then we would go ahead and do a neck dissection. Dr. Limans, for follow-up? For like follow-up, yeah, it depends, of course, on, on what you have done to the patient uh, at his initial treatment. If he had uh, major surgery and radiation therapy, there's, there's, there's pretty less uh, to do. You, you, uh, you can still do. Uh, but then we come into the scenario we talked in the previous panel. We will make an MRI at, uh, at uh, three months, and if that's negative, we rely on the... Uh, if, on the other hand, there is still a possibility to do either a neck dissection because there was only radiation in the first place yeah. or radiation uh, because there was only a neck dissection in the first place, uh, we would either do an MRI or an ultrasound, I think. Mm -hmm. To sum this up, postoperatively or pre in the post-treatment uh, neck, the decision is much more individualized than it is mm -hmm. in the primary staging of a neck. Now, and are there other questions from the... Jeff, please. I'd just like to make a couple comments. You know, you talked before about what's the best study to get uh, pre-treatment, and I agree with Professor Vogel that it may not matter so much whether it's an MRI or a CT scan, but having the same uh, imaging modality to follow response to treatment and subsequent to treatment I think is critical, and we get good CT scans and often use those rather than MRIs. And a lot of it depends on, as you said, uh, Professor Ambrose, what they come in with, if it's useful and we can save some money to the system by using the same modality, that's very nice. Uh, another point I would just like to bring up and maybe ask the panel what they think about this. Uh, I was approached by Professor uh, uh, Max Som at um, or is it Peter Som, the son? Peter Som, who's at Mount Sinai, and he's a radiologist and very well known, and he has been proposing the idea of a post-operative or post-treatment routine imaging. And it's always, to me, a little bit of a question between the art and the science of medicine. Certainly on clinical protocols where you're evaluating some unique treatment you want to follow with an objective imaging criteria like CT, MRI, or PET, but when you have a patient that you've already used maximal therapy on, let's say a very advanced tumor, surgery, radiation, <coughs> chemotherapy, and they finally get them through this difficult treatment and they're feeling well, uh, the, the benefit of getting a CT scan every month or every three months and picking up an early recurrence that's asymptomatic versus a uh, you know, that you can't really necessarily treat is um, unknown. So I'll maybe put that to, your, to you and your panel, what you think about sort of routine imaging outside the context of uh, clinical trials. Rene? Yes, I, I would uh, agree entirely. Uh, we, we do a baseline uh, study just to be able to compare it later on if necessary, but we would not do a routine uh, examination after uh, heavy, uh, heavy treatment before. I think it sort of, if I can, it reflects your American patient population, life survival at all costs. And I think the problem with doing serial scanning is, and what are you going to do if it does show up a positivity? 
uh, are you going to intervene or do you enter them into palliative maintenance chemotherapy or some, some other form of trial, then th in a way that depends on the concept of the patient, the socioeconomic, the psycho comorbidity, etc. that your patients have got, uh, and as to whether or not they were entered into a trial at the start. So I think it would be very useful if those patients could be recruited into other trials which would give us gene therapy or manipulation or immunotherapy or something in the uh, palliative sort of role. But equally I do agree with, with Jay Shah that never give up is probably the right answer equally. So you may identify some of your patients uh, to do it, but it's, it's really cost effectiveness I think is what you've got to do. You increase your patient's anxiety that they, you know, they're waiting for the next MR scan on the assumption that the last one was okay, the next one will be okay. I don't know is the honest answer. Now my last question would regard the future perspectives of uh, Professor Fabian um, regarding uh, the nanoparticle studies. No, no, um, are nice. these nanoparticles yeah. now approved by the FDA? Can we use them? Then <clears throat> what about the metabolism? Are there any side effects with this? And do you think that this will uh, be, have an impact for practical medicine? For as I understand you, you must, uh, must do two MRIs. One without yeah, the nanoparticles, then give the nanoparticles intravenously, and then to another uh, second MRI. Do you think that there, are, uh, there will be in the future very uh, specific indications for its big effort and its costly? Um, I think it's a very good question, and I will try to, uh, to answer in, in the details. A good thing with all these nanoparticles, they are uh, their tolerability is extremely good. They have uh, more or less no side effects. Uh, some patients might develop it's a more than, a lower than 0.1% uh, back pain. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is, uh, in this study we had, in, uh, we had an infusion over 30 minutes and a second scan. The new particles which will come on the market will be able to you give them intravenously and start with the scanning very early. So because the uptake in the lymphocytes will be very fast. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, what we showed in our study together uh, here with the Frankfurt group, that uh, there might be an impact on the therapy decision, the early therapy decision. And as you might have seen in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the same particles have been used for prostatic cancer. And uh, so they really showed that there was a completely change in therapy. And, and I think that not for a patient who has bilateral lymph node masses, no, which is, is clinically clear. evaluated, mm -hmm. but those patients which we had here in the panel, mm -hmm. where a decision has to be made, I think that might be mm -hmm. an impact, and this will be superior to anything what we know so far, like PET-CT or PET. But it will be restricted, and again, it's my focus and also my thank to our collaborations here in Frankfurt and the tumor board that those patients have to be discussed and I think the same is valid for protocols. We have with the clinical, clinical partners to discuss the, uh, what is the patient, the best follow-up for the patient. Of course, we are radiologists would like, like Peter Song, I was also trained with him, uh, he wants to do a CT study at best every two months. This is maybe possible in his institution, but we cannot afford to do it even in Germany. So I think it's, it's better to depict those patients which might benefit mm. from a very s serious and a, from a protocol of their follow-up and to differentiate from those patients where there's no other therapy options or maybe we can postpone these uh, uh, post-scanning. But I think the nanoparticles will really help you as clinicians as in radiotherapy, in diagnostic ENT surgery, uh, to have more, uh, a better uh, decision for the individual patient. Is there, a, by the way, is there a, a difference uh, in the in the sensitivity uh, between uh, lymph nodes, let me say pelvic nodes, or very superficial lying neck nodes? No, the, the good the good thing is with the neck that we can bet, do better and higher resolution images because with new coils we are lower than zero point uh, uh, millimeters now. So. Uh, this will be easier than the pelvis, as you know. But yeah. even in the pelvis and even in breast cancer, there was also paper now in the New England Journal of Medicine for breast cancer, this uh, will have also an influence, like the sentinel node technique. Yeah. So you would say this is one of the promising... Now we are, um, unfortunately, we are waiting now for two years. Uh, yeah. And the interesting thing is that uh, not well-planned studies, which had been done by the company who is producing those drugs, both in U.S. and Europe, and they had been tried to get it very early through the FDA, and so they had problems. So still, that's the reason why we are waiting for the approval. But maybe end of the year. Yeah. 
No, I see no other questions from the audience, so I would like to thank again uh, Dr. Vogel for his lecture and the participants in the panel and uh, give over to the, to the next uh, speakers uh, with the treatment of neck node metastasis. Thank you very much.